Uh, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Um, uh, I'm Joe Baum. Um, I'm the director of Good Law Project, and I'm here this evening with Adam Wagner, um, author of um, Emergency State, uh, of which I have no fewer than um, three copies on the shelf behind me. Uh, it's that good. Um, please um, read it. Uh, please buy it, and we'll post a link to the book later in this conversation. Um, please also do share um, questions. We've got people monitoring our various social media feeds. If you'd like uh, me to ask Adam a question on your behalf uh, at the end of this, towards the end of this conversation, uh, we'll pick that question up and, and I'll put it to Adam if it's a polite and interesting one. Um, if it's a rude and interesting one, I might do, but I make no promises. Um, so, Adam, um, you have kids. You have a partner you love. You have a successful practice as a barrister. Uh, you have a Twitter account. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, um, you've written a book. How many Adam Wagners are there? How did the idea for the book came about? Uh, thanks so much for having me on the chat. It's really good to um, good to see you've got those three copies of the book. I recommend everyone gets three copies just in case. You know, <laughs> never know what's going to happen. Um, I um, I wrote the book. I mean, I've been thinking about writing a book for ages, um, and and I was waiting for the right idea to come along. Um, and after the first couple of years of the pandemic, um, I realised that I had access to a story um, that I didn't think anybody else really had access to, which was the story of the regulations that imposed the restrictions in the lockdown and in the in, in, and throughout those first two years of the pandemic. And, and the reason I had access to it is because, you know, to put it simply, I've been tweeting and writing about it and working in it for the, that, almost that entire two years um, in all different ways. And um, and I'd kept a record, and the record was in my Twitter feed. It was in my um, geeky spreadsheet, which I put online, and it was in the writing that I'd done um, uh, and the work that I'd done over those two years. So I, I, obviously, the pandemic happened to us all, and, and it happened. The story of it. There's many, many different stories from a million, tens of millions of different perspectives. But from that story, to me, the story of the restrictions seemed like a really important one and I, and I was actually I was quite worried that if I didn't sort of get it out of myself um, then that might be if not lost then at least uh, it wasn't obvious to me who, who else would tell the story in that way. And um, you talk about your Twitter account was that sort of part of the process um, of reconstructing um, the events that you describe in the book? Um, yeah, I mean, it was central to it, really. My, my, my wife said to me um, uh, when I was thinking about the book, she said, you know, look, you've got you wrote a diary during the pandemic. You've got your Twitter feed. If it had been in a in a book, uh, you know, if it had been in a journal, it would have been a diary. And, and, and I downloaded my Twitter feed from those two years and got rid of the extraneous um, bits of the which there were some. And, and and there it was. That was the story. And I've been, you know, obsessively cataloging everything, um, you know, to the point of, of lying awake at half past 11 on a Sunday night, waiting for the new regulations to drop so that I could try and detangle them um, and give them a bit of a sort of look over before they came into force, usually the next morning. So it, it was all there. Or at least I say it was all there. It was obviously wasn't all there, but in terms of a structure for a book, and the book really just does follow that structure. It goes from the beginning um, until the point where I was writing it, um, which was actually that the day I finished writing it and, the and sent the final draft was the day that Boris Johnson resigned, um, which was a an extraordinary bookend to that period. Um, and um, uh, certainly if I try and think back to what happened to me during the pandemic, um, I sort of discovered that I was almost in a sort of fugue state for those several years. And I can remember very, very little. Um, 
those of us who are on social media, I suppose all of us have that that ability to reconstruct um, what was then in our minds. Yeah, and I think you, what you describe is is how a lot of people have described their feeling when they're reading the book, which is, my God, I, I don't, I'd, I'd put this all under a, in a, under a rug in my consciousness because it was a very strange period, as particularly when we were being locked down. It was a kind of time. A lot of people spoke about the time stopping, or it was a it was a time out of time. I, I described it in in the book, the beginning of the lockdown, as being a bit like um, there's a Stephen King short story i think it's called the 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 longolias where a um where a plane full of passengers goes through a sort of some sort of rip in space time and it lands at the an airport just as time has moved on um in uh, ahead of it so that everything is kind of still and everybody's gone and time is um slowly sort of catching up with them and it's a really um, it's a really strange book, as in it's a very sort of strange feeling you get from the book. And I I think that's what the pandemic was like in a way. It was as if everything froze um, and we had to deal with a different reality, um, which is makes it all the more important to go back and, and really figure out what went on, because what went on was was extraordinary and important, incredibly important to understand. Yes, Um but it's not uh, a book about um, the fugue or um, internal state of the minds of all of us who lived through the pandemic. Um, it's about something um, much more resonant um, through the ages than that. And perhaps you could just talk to those foolish people who have yet to buy their three copies um, about... Um, what the central thesis of the book is. So the book is about the, the state of emergency, which became what I call the emergency state. Um, and it, it, it's looking at the pandemic in the UK, particularly and a bit internationally, um, through the lens of what happens during a, a genuine emergency in societies. Um, and, and I you know, having worked in human rights law for a while, I've seen these kind of ex examples of other sorts of emergency laws. Um, but it's it seems like during the pandemic, like in other real emergencies, we, as a society, we sort of switch everything around for a period. Um, we we suspend certain things. We suspend certain aspects of democracy so that the leader can take swift and um, sort of merciless decisions. Um, a lot of resources get transferred into this, the sort of the, the war against the emergency, the war against the threat. I mean, sometimes it might be a war or a pandemic or an economic shock, but it's the, the state becomes something quite different. Um, it's like rallying the troops. Like a, it's like a weapon, in fact, that's how I describe it. It's like a, a weapon that societies have, whether they're democratic or not to fight off a threat. Um, and at the same time, as well as there being advantages to that, and there are obviously advantages to the state being able to become more um, responsive and quick and powerful to deal with a huge threat. There are also costs, um, costs such as when you give a leader or a very small group of people uh, enormous power, as we know from you know, society, from history, that comes with enormous risks of um, corruption, of mistakes being made, of the basic the benefits of of democracy being being ramroded by um, by this sort of this 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 concentration of power, and I think we saw we saw all of that in the pandemic to different degrees. And um, I mean, as lawyers, we obsess about process um, because I suppose instinctively we think that from better quality processes um, come better quality decisions. Um, your book doesn't just um, identify um, that this thing happened and um, describe it. It has some um, important points to make about what went right and what went wrong. Um, 
And, um, you know, where, where, where did the emergency state function well? Um, uh, and, and, and where um, do, does the book say, at least, that it, it might have done better? So, so what what the book isn't is a sort of catalogue of all of the restrictions and, a, and an accounting of of whether they worked or, or not. Um, and I've and I've dip, but I do dip into certain of the restrictions, which I think I'm sort of I, I've 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 given enough thought to. Um, so, for example, the right to protest. I did, I did a lot of work in the pandemic about the right to protest, um, and, and particularly the the reclaim these streets case. And I think there was. There was a sort of um, there was a shadow ban on protest because protest was never banned explicitly. It was permitted explicitly for a few months in the regulations, but it was never banned. But it was treated as being banned, uh, wrongly treated as being completely banned um, by the police, and we know that from the the reclaim these streets case. And and I think that that just taking that as an example, um, one of the one of the criticisms I have about the way the emergency state worked is that ultimately the decision making was was incredibly limited in in the num the number of people making decisions was very very limited, and if you talk to um, uh, sort of senior civil servants during that period, they they will say the same thing. Essentially, there were four four guys who were making decisions. There was Boris Johnson, Rishi Sunak, Matt Hancock, and Michael Gove. They had they were the the COVID cabinet committee. And then a very small group around them of civil servants and people who sort of were in on that and Dominic Cummings for a while. And, and I think that one of the downsides, so, so there's an upside of that is you can make decisions quickly. You don't need to, um, you know, um, worry about arguing as par in parliament as um, Dominic Cummings puts it. But the disadvantage is it's who's in the room becomes unbelievably important. Um, and so you have these strange, um, this strange skewing of priorities that you see as the as the um, as the pandemic went on. So an example is the right to protest. That after the first lockdown, it became lawful for the rest of the pandemic for churches, synagogues, mosques, any places of worship to open as long as they had social distancing. You could have hundreds of people inside a mosque or a or a church or a synagogue um, as long as they were sort of they were using precautions. But for a very significant part of the pandemic. You couldn't have two people outside protesting, you know, socially distanced, which I think is, is I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously wrong in principle to allow one thing and the other or not the other. And in fact, I know that the two people couldn't protest because I had some clients um, briefly who were trying to protest outside the Volkswagen garage um, in, um, in part, some part of London and were, and were moved on by the police repeatedly saying you're not allowed to protest. And there were two of them um, against the because it was the um, protesting against the persecution of Uyghur Muslims in um, in China, and so you, you had this straight. There's lots of other examples of that. This sort of skewing of priorities, and and I think that the um, that that's one real issue. And I think that the more we learn about what was happening, um, the more we'll find out about that skewing of priorities. And I think an, another real issue from a democratic perspective, and and, and I'm. I know that lawyer, lawyers do like to talk about process and, and uh, things written down and all of that records. But I think from a democratic perspective, the fact that there were 109 laws, um, probably the most restrictive laws in, in history, certainly the most restrictive statutory instruments, there were 109 of them over two years, like roughly one a week. Um, Parliament considered eight of them in advance before they came into force. The rest of them all came into force as soon as Matt Hancock signed the piece of paper um, none of them were amended because they couldn't be. Not a single one was struck down. Not a single one was considered by the um, by the High Court in a full hearing and a substantive judicial review. And certainly none were struck down. I just think from a from a democratic perspective, when you had hotel quarantine, um, bans on protest, bans on worship for a couple of for three months, bans on um, people being able to see their relatives, these sort of unbelievable restrictions. The fact that they were, they just were sort of passed on the nod for two years. I, I think is really um, problematic from a democratic perspective. And it's problematic from a democratic perspective because it's um, the people in the room 
um, rather than Parliament making these decisions? Yeah, I mean, it, it because they just weren't they weren't properly looked at. <laughs> I mean, this is one of the strange things about um, constantly being told I was the only one following the regulations um, through the pandemic. Um, that I, I I didn't see that as a as a good thing. Um, I, I saw that as a bad thing because there's a there's 1,400 parliamentarians whose job it is to analyze laws that are that affect the lives of, of everybody in the country in sort of very substantial ways. Um, and I just don't think I think they sort of gave up. They they took a view that um, well, with the, you know the Conservatives have a big majority. Um, that we're not going to be able to knock them down. We can't amend them, um, and we're not get, we're not seeing them until you know the, the times they actually debated them before they came into force. They usually got the regulations the, the night before. Um, I, I just think it's a um, the, the so someone said to me the other night a parliamentarian said, "Well, you know, it wouldn't have made a difference anyway, because um, because what you know the public wanted it, everybody supported it, everybody wanted lockdowns, but you know." Just to take hotel quarantine as an example, so hotel quarantine was effectively detention of um, over two hundred thousand people um, over the course of a few months um, who were coming from red list countries. There were probably thousands of children amongst those people. Um, I did lots of cases about hotel quarantine, and the um, the, the conditions were um, were sometimes terrible. There was sort of sexual harassment by private security guards. People are locked in their room. I mean, what is, it's not locked in a hotel. You're locked in a room for two weeks um, with or 10 days with a private guard outside the door. You can't go for exercise except for 15 minutes in the car park. This is pretty serious stuff. It's a lot, you know, it's as serious as control orders or um, license condition, you know, stringent license conditions on individuals. Um, Parliament, I think, debated it for five hours. Um, they, they looked at it weeks after it came into force. As a policy, it was announced, um, it was leaked into the Telegraph months before the regulations uh, appeared. So the government were clearly planning it, but they didn't bother putting it into Parliament. Um, and Parliament didn't, you know, took no, paid no attention to it. I just find it amazing. I mean, there's, there's only 80,000 people in the prison estate. There were over 200,000 in hotel quarantine. And um, I, I think that's that's not just a kind of, process point i think it's 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 an a, 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 it's a dereliction of duty so it it raises sort of constitutional questions about where the power to lock up in hotel rooms 200,000 people for extended periods of time comes from um what's the democratic uh legitimacy for that but does it sort of skew the types of decisions, the outcomes um, that are made in other ways? Um, I, I, I would have thought so. I mean, you know, um, the, the, there's, the, the, there's the corruption, um, which I think is is to be, you know, to be looked at um, still. I, I, I think a lot of what was happening during the pandemic, we, we don't know about, but... So just the, the, the sort of slightly um, comedic example I give in the book about the grouse shooting exception. You know, th this, was an, this was an example during the second lockdown sort of period or during the summer, I think it was during the summer of 2020, there was a, um, there was a lot of pressure on the prime minister from his backbenchers to allow grouse shooting as an exception to the regulations. Um, and a meeting was called by Michael Gove um, f to discuss it in the cabinet committee. And it was cancelled at the last minute because civil servants were instructed to, instead of putting an exception for grouse shooting, they were instructed to make an exception that didn't say grouse shooting, but was about grouse shooting. So it was called the outdoor sports exception. Um, and and that, that came into force. And the only reason um, anybody ever knew what it was about was because it got reported by the Huffington Post. and. Um, Dominic Raab, I asked Dominic Raab about it on Twitter and he said, well, I, I got a phone call from the Prime Minister while I was driving saying I'm getting a lot of incoming um, from, from, my, from the whips, he said, um, about uh, grouse shooting. We're going to have to put it into the regulations. And Dominic Cummings um, described himself banging on the steering wheel saying no, 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 because it will be um, Wensbury unreasonable as in it's going to get struck down by a court. Um, but but obviously it wasn't. Um, and I said to him, well, what else 
were there other decisions taken on that basis? And he said there were loads. Um, pressure from the from the from Carry the Telegraph. I, I mean, look, you've got to take it with a pinch of salt what he says, but you add that together with the the VIP lane stuff, um, and I know from from cases that I was um, involved in as well that the people who had access to ministers used it and they were listened to, um, and that's so I, I I've saw, I've saw that saw that absolutely directly, um, and. And I think it's a reflection of, um, I'll put it like this. I don't, I don't, I don't think it's a reflection of um, ministers who were trying to personally enrich themselves and, you know, who went into this job to just protect themselves and their friends and that sort of thing. I think it was something slightly different. I think it was that if you give power to a very small group of people over everybody's lives, and you, you make it a closed and sealed box, that power, and there's no way of influencing. You've got no, your local MP is useless because they're not going to do anything about, they can't do anything. You can't, you know, the mayor, as Andy Burnham found out, the mayors, the local area mayors had absolutely no leverage at all. Um, ultimately, it's about who has access to those individuals, just like it is in a in an autocratic state or in a um, in a state with a, where, you know, where, with a king in a palace. And I think what, what, what we, what, it started to turn into the way things were being run was um, something that rep that looks more like an autocratic state because everything is about it becomes about patronage and access to the leaders. Um, and I think the VIP lane was another example of that. It wasn't, it, from what I understand, it wasn't implemented because the idea was let's all just enrich our friends. It was implemented because it was a way of avoiding the usual um, mechanisms of um, checking and scrutiny um to make do things a lot quicker but the but the cost of that is you have to do it in a way which effectively privileges access and ex pre-existing contacts um, and that that isn't um a very good way for a democracy to run well and we can also see um that the people who did get privileged certainly those introduced by politicians were introduced exclusively by Conservative Party politicians. So, to the best of my knowledge, not a single VIP contract that was introduced by a politician was introduced by a politician who wasn't a Tory politician. Um, and um, so, you, you know, you have to have a degree of scepticism uh, about um whether these things operated um, even at a sort of theoretical level in ways that were consistent with good um, governance. Um, I mean, the thing that really struck me actually, uh, thinking back about um, PPE procurement, which I suppose is the thing I know most about during the course of the pandemic, um, was how the absence of parliamentary scrutiny um, caused politicians to make, uh, or, or at least those few politicians in whose power, in whose hands power continued to rest, caused politicians to make decisions that were very, very political. So I have a sense now um, of response to the pandemic not being driven by the public interest, um, not being driven by um, the long-term financial sustainability of um, government spending, um, uh, not being driven by minimising the risk to life, but by but 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 these pandemic problems being seen instead through a lens of um, party political advantage. How do we? Um, make this political problem for us go away. Um, and, and fundamentally, that's um, a very important thing that you lose when you remove parliamentarians from the equation, at least as it seems to me. I think that's right. And, and, and I... So, so there was there was a bit of the pandemic where Parliament sort of sparked to life a bit. Um, it was in around it was around the tears. Um, so when we had the three tears, and it was sort of autumn winter of twenty twenty, and at that point, um, 
what happened was you had this you had this summer of an attempt to localize COVID restrictions. So in, in, you would have, first of all, local lockdowns. So there was all of these areas. Um, in, in fact, the smallest area was a, was a factory, the um, Glencore Food Factory, which was given its own set of regulations um, they, because there was an outbreak in the factory. But the, all the other regulations were sort of Leicester, Leicester or Birmingham or Manchester and all, all the places, particularly in the north, that were seen as COVID hotspots. And the mayors um, tried to get involved because they said, well, we don't want our area being put into tier three because we don't, you know, look at the figures. Um, and the most prominent one was Andy Burnham. And Andy Burnham sort of negotiated with the government for a bit um, and put his foot down and said, no, it's, um, there's not enough support for business. We, don't, we can't go into tier three. And eventually the government, I think the government just realised, well, he's got no leverage. There's nothing he can do to... Um, to change the thing we, we've got all the power there's no the local mps are not are not engaged so they just walk, walked out of the regulations and they put manchester in tier three and that was that and nobody else objected but then um the the covid recovery group was formed um around that time or just after that time which was the group of tory um mps who were um, I, I, something, you know, a bit libertarian um, that I think they presented it as for sort of they pro-business and anti-closures and they were certainly anti-lockdown. Um, and they, they called, they were the only instance of any parliamentarians causing the government any um, trouble at all um, in terms of the, the regulations. So it was because of um, their, it, it was at Steve Baker's um, intervention when, um, the government decided to, for the first time, put the regulations in front of Parliament before they were passed. So before they came into force, that was with the tears. But you're absolutely right. The, the, the only pressure that really I think the Prime Minister felt he was under was political because he wasn't under any any other pressure. The courts had, had said, not for us. Um, the, um, uh, the, the, the opposition were, were saying, I mean, they were... They weren't against any restrictions. They were they were um, saying we want them earlier and harder. Um, so I suppose that was a, a bit of a bit of pressure, but it wasn't there wasn't any there wasn't any real consideration of all the different aspects. There was kind of lot oh we're going to lock down or not lock down, but the the restrictions themselves were so complicated and various. You know, you had hotel quarantine, COVID passes, face covering rules gathering bans, stay-at-home orders, travel restrictions, the red list, the the, the green list, and, and all of that. It, it was self-isolation rules, which were completely different to, they were effectively sort of personalised lockdowns um, for people with COVID, much more stricter than lockdown regulations. Couldn't go out for exercise. Yeah, there, there was so much to do with these regulations, and there was so little actually done. Um, but I, I do, I agree. I think that it became very political. I mean, I don't, I don't think I was going as far as saying it was that was the only consideration because I think a, a big part of the consideration was what Sage was saying and what they were recommending. But I do think a it was sort of a um it, it was it was a strange distortion of the usual way that, that that our democracy runs, where it was in the brain, most of it was just in the brain of the Prime Minister and what he was worried about rather than what Parliament was worried about or what the people were worried about. I don't know if you read that extraordinary story in Sebastian Payne's sort of account of the last days of Boris Johnson that the FT carried over the weekend. He describes um, planning for the possibility that Boris Johnson would seek to avoid getting kicked out of number 10 by calling a general election. Uh, and he says that uh, uh, um, three um, senior uh, civil servants um, told Boris Johnson that if uh, he tried to suspend Parliament to call a general election, uh, the Queen would um, be unavailable, uh, would not come to the phone. And, you know, at one level, you think, well, um, perhaps that's a pretty good outcome. Perhaps he oughtn't to have uh, been able to dodge that personal bullet. Um, by calling a general election, which uh, an orthodox reading of the Constitution um, would tend to suggest uh, as being something he could do. But at another level, do you think, um, well, who are um, these uh, people in um, 
English public life who have the power um, to make decisions like that. And, and where does that come from? I suppose the reason I'm thinking of that story just listening to you now is because um, we can describe uh, a world that is um, suboptimal in some way. But ultimately, the question is this, um, how do we make it better? And, and that's the question really for you. Um, what ought to have happened during the course of the pandemic, um, uh, and in particular, the legislation that's the principal focus of your book, um, that, that, that didn't happen? Um, I, I did read read that account, and um, it actually reminded me um, a bit of reading about the, um, the 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 generals that served under um, Donald Trump when he was president, and there was lots of stories about how they would, how they what they would do if he ordered them to do something they didn't want to do, such as you know launch a nuclear weapon or um, go to war with a with, with a country. Like how they what what sort of strange slightly sort of childlike um uh, protections they 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 would put in place you know such as you know not not connecting the phone or, or something like that and 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 that is i think that's what comes down that that's sometimes what comes from having a a, a leader who is capable of t of doing very erratic fit and quite sort of dangerous things um but so so one of the things that i i, I say there should be um, there should be four four differences um, at the end of the book. Um, one of them is is a legal one, which is that the Public Health Act, I think, is just a really um, odd bit of legislation because it gives so much power to um, almost unlimited power to the health secretary, um, but without the safeguards that you get under other emergency legislation and particularly the Civil Contingencies Act. So. If, if the, Dominic Cummings said the reason they didn't use the Civil Contingencies Act is because they were advised there would be they they would have stuff struck down, um, and 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 you can see why because the it, it's just a lot better for scrutiny. You have you have to bring law to, you have to bring regulations to Parliament within seven days rather than twenty eight under the Public Health Act. So that's a big change, and also Parliament can amend regulations under the Civil Contingencies Act. Because I think that there's a, a realization that Parliament might actually want to do more than strike, might not want to strike down emergency legislation, because that's a it's, a, it's too nuclear, because it's it leaves the country completely unprotected, and you want Parliament to actually be involved. And I think there was a there was a sort of um, there was a, a defeatist attitude to parliamentary scrutiny um, at the time, and it, you know this isn't stuff in retrospect. A, a lot of what I've written in the book is. What was what I was saying from basically from April 2020, and was writing about, and you know I was um, working with the Joint Committee on Human Rights, writing reports that said all these things. Um, but I think there was a defeatist attitude. There was a sort of attitude. Well, we can't. We're not going to do primary legislation because that takes too long, or that's too cumbersome, and we can't. Um, you know, the, the regulation. We can't um, amend the regulations. So what? What good is any of this? How could we possibly? scrutinize how could we possibly uh, do anything about all this but i think that's just nonsense really i think um in 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 it's if parliament had wanted to it could have taken a a proper active role and got involved um and i also say that there's an issue of um the constitutional issue um and particularly what what are in a written constitution which the vast majority of democracies have um excluding basically us, New Zealand and Israel, I think, in, in the world now. Um, but at least in a written constitution, you know what a state of emergency is. Um, it actually says, this is a state of emergency. These are the powers the government has. This is how you challenge it. This is when it ends. Um, and, and all of those are really important um, principal things that you want to have right out there in public. You don't want to have a situation where well, you've got the, the Queen not answering the phone, I think it's the ultimate um, e example of, don't worry, the, 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 the good chaps will sort it out, or the good, the good Queen. Um, but, you know, on, on a basic level, we just don't, you know, there was a, st a state of emergency was declared by Matt Hancock on, the, on Valentine's Day, 2020. 
um, on the 14th of March, uh, February 2020, a state of emergency was declared. Matt Hancock put a notice in the London Gazette to, to declare the state of emergency. And I'm not sure there's anybody, there's many people in the world that know that apart from me. Um, and that's just really strange. Um, I, I mean, I've got the I've got the declaration, but who, you know, who knew that, that there was a state of emergency declared? Who knew it lasted for 763 days and ended on the 22nd of March, 2022? And during that state of emergency, it gave the Secretary of State and the government, you know, almost unlimited powers to do what they had to do, or they felt that they had to do to control people's behaviour, to prevent the spread of, 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 of this virus. So I think that the, just on a basic level, I know people are very, get very um, enervated about um, the idea of a written constitution. There's lots of arguments against it. We don't want to turn into America and all of that. But I do think on, on one level, it's, it's very bad that we don't know. We don't know what the boundaries of government power are during emergencies because lots of emergencies emergencies happen um they you, you don't know who's going to be in charge you're stuck with the leader that's in charge at the time when the emergency happened you don't get to choose you know germany had a phd um chemist <laughs> and we had boris johnson um and and you know that there, there is the, 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 i i actually think boris johnson in some ways was suited to certain aspects of the pandemics i think he communicated very very well to the public i know from my parents you know they sat in front of the tv every night watching him and i think got a lot of comfort from the way he explained things and, and the way that they the sort of relationship they had and i think that's good but i think in other respects he wasn't he's not a particularly strong democrat um boris johnson he sort of you know i think he tolerates um parliament but he's not he doesn't i don't think he sees it as a massive benefit um and at points where he could dispense of it such as prorogation or or the covid regulations he did so um i think we do need um some form of if not a written constitution because people can't stomach it then at least some sort of better articulated version of what an emergency is and what the powers that the government gets during it are yeah because um it's interesting isn't it to think to yourself well um we've just been through a pandemic um, let's assume, sorry, everybody, um, that we're hit by another one tomorrow. Um, how does the world look different now? How does government's response differ now um, to how we um, responded then? What, what, what changes um, us having just lived through this experience in terms of how uh, the state responds? Um, well, I think if we if if a pandemic appeared tomorrow, I think we'd be locking down and very very quickly. Um, and I don't think we've thought enough about what that means. Um, what, one thing that I I didn't realise before I wrote the book is that national lockdowns as an idea are, are really really new and really unprecedented. I could only find two examples of national lockdowns. I think for three days in Sierra Leone and five days in Mexico, all in the past sort of ten years. Um, so when China locked down in, in Wuhan in 20, February 2020, um, that was it was a, it was a big experiment, um, and it's been a big experiment for those two years. Um, that's not to say that the other measures like curfews or, or restriction, uh, uh, so gathering bans, school closures, theatre closures, that, pub closures, that sort of thing, those are pretty standard. Quarantine, especially, that those are pretty standard for plagues and have been for hundreds of years. So. It, it's on a continuum, but it's different. And I think that one of the things we, we haven't really grappled with is whether, you know, wh whether that was right or wrong, whether that was too much, too little, um, all of that. Um, but I think that also if a pandemic happened tomorrow, we'd use the same laws. We'd probably, the government would probably do exactly what it did last time. We'd lose parliament's input um, for a couple of years, unless parliament took a different view. Now there is a, um, Someone told me, um, a civil servant told me recently that there has been a bit of a step change following the pandemic for the scrutiny of statutory instruments. That there is, the, the statutory instruments are big, MPs are demanding to, to scrutinize statutory instruments in a way that they haven't. Um, so these are secondary legislation. So legislation that generally just gets um, put through on the nod. 
um, rather than pr primary legislation, which has to go lot through, through lots of stages. But that's quite encouraging that I think Parliament maybe has come out, um, you know, out, out of the fugue that it was in, um, sort of self-imposed prorogation. And, um, and rub, people are rubbing their eyes and thinking maybe we should um, pay a bit more attention to what's going on in these instruments. Um, and that's quite good. But I, I don't know whether that will stick if we get go through another emergency because everybody, um, buck, you know, um, uh, sort of hunkers down during an emergency in a way that um, stops them um, sticking their necks out. So we don't know, really, whether anything would be different by um, anything being different, I mean, the way in which legislation was made and scrutinised um, were another pandemic to hit tomorrow. Um, I think that's where you landed. Um, and I suppose um, my question is, well, if public approval ratings were high during the pandemic, if the public felt as your parents did that by and large the government was doing a pretty good job. Um, did the concerns of lawyers really matter? And, and I suppose if so, why? Um, I think that's a really important critique of, of my position, which is, you know, does ultimately, if, if the government is doing what the people want, then isn't that the point of democracy? And isn't that the point of the government? And um, and I think that there is something in that because it, it, it but 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 my worry is that um, uh, during emergencies something funny happens to our brains. Um, I think I mean I, I think psychologists would 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 uh, prove that have uh, proved that that we we think differently. We we sort of we want to be led much more, even those of us who don't usually want to be led. We're, we're, we want to protect our own. We're not as interested in the wider world as we are about our own small communities, our families. Um, and I think that exposes us to risks that in in, a, in normal non-emergency times, we're quite sort of robust with our um, scepticism of government, but that scepticism sort of disappears a bit during emergencies. And I think it's not a lawyer's point, it's more of a Democrat point, that if you are going to well, during an emergency you have to make sure you keep the lines of um skepticism uh running you have to force force skepticism one of the way to force these things is to make sure that you've got 600 or 1400 parliamentarians who are on it um, and at least some of them will will understand and will see what's going on and um, i think the courts as well i think that the courts it's you know it's become really fashionable to say the courts should just stay away from these contentious issues um, where rights are being balanced and that sort of thing, because that's for government. And I, I just don't agree. I think that the courts are an, a really important check um, and balance on on the on Parliament and on society. And that that and when you've got human rights protections, that's what the courts should be doing. They should be. You know, the, the 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 courts in other countries didn't didn't do what our courts did and sort of say it's all for government. In France, the, um, the, the the constitutional court struck down fifty um, COVID laws. Um, in Spain, they um, the constitutional court struck down the entire state of emergency. They paid back every single fine um, from the first three months of the pandemic. We had none of that, um, and and it worries me that yes, in the broad sense, the public wanted something to be done, and something was done. But what was done in our names? Um, I just don't think we we spent enough time or attention um, considering it. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I'm going to start putting to you um, some questions for um, from um, our audience. And I should say that um, Adam's going to look at the questions after we've finished uh, and we'll get in touch with um, the three people who've sent in the questions Adam most likes and send them a free copy um, of the book. So do still keep them coming. Um, we do still have uh, time. But um, there's this point as well, isn't there? Um, if you can't feel confident after a recent pandemic um, that laws would be 
um, made in a different way uh, 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 in the event of another pandemic. You have also to ask yourself questions, well, how would things be different um, in the event of an emergency state arising for a different reason? Um, can, can we be confident that there are proper checks of executive power that, that are exercised for reasons that are more publicly contentious than a pandemic? Um, no, I, I, I don't see why we would be, um, because, I mean, we, we, we've, we've lived through the war on terror, um, and I think that's another example of a time of, of real fear um, and, and justifiable fear. You know, after, I, I'll, I'll never forget the, the feeling after the um, after 9/11 after the the twin towers fell um, and were destroyed and the attack on the Pentagon and then after 2005 the the attacks in London which I was very close to um, the, the feeling there of, of being under physical threat um, is is an important feeling because it clarifies it clarifies a society's purpose um, because societies are meant to protect the people inside them but on the other hand it it, it creates huge risks of overreach of um taking of, of of channeling that that fear in the wrong direction such as i mean the war in iraq the cl absolute classic example a um that something must be done oh well i've been meaning to do something anyway um you know from george bush's perspective let's go and do it and everybody and, and, and people were hugely supportive i know there was a big opposition but people were hugely supportive because they were told well you you're feeling fearful I know the thing is going to stop you feeling fearful, which so I'm going to invade Iraq, which didn't follow logically, but it was, but it was hugely supported because it was a use of, I think it's a, it, that was a use of the emergency and it was an exploiting of the emergency. Um, and I don't know whether George Bush or Tony Blair thought of it in those terms. I imagine they convinced themselves it wasn't, but it was. And, and I think that the, 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 the laws we saw after the war on terror as well, you know, there was, there was, they were really, um, problematic in certain ways, the um, the unlimited detention um, without trial um, that was eventually um, ruled to be unlawful by the House of Lords, um, the mass uh, mass surveillance architecture and, and torture as well, the use of torture. We saw all that, and we should have learned from all that that you've got to really um, protect. We've got to protect ourselves from ourselves um, during those times. Yeah, if there's a transfer of power from Parliament to to the executive and to um, spads that the executive appoints, um, who, who's to control how those powers are used? Is it um, uh, going to be the case that government will um, serve its own political needs, perhaps under cover of of, uh, of less contentious uses of those powers? So, some questions from um, viewers. Firstly, from Bert. What positive steps can be taken against politicians who don't see themselves as answerable to the, the democratic process? Um, I mean, all we can do is, is convince other politicians to um, put in place protections um, or vote them out. Um, and I don't think there's much, I don't think there's much else you can do. I mean, look, obviously, if, if, if it gets to an extreme point, I say obviously, um, it's not obvious at all. If it gets to an extreme point where it's a sort of, it's, it becomes a criminal offence, um, particularly misconduct in public office, and that's particularly if they are doing something which is um, ag against the public interest and for private, usually for private gain, um, then that is a criminal offence and that can be dealt with by the courts. But I think generally problems with democracies have to be dealt with in a democratic way through, through the democratic process. Um, and that is the that is the way the way it operates and i think that's and and, and that is it, it ultimately it's, i think these questions are political and we have to make political political arguments to create political change and that takes a long time and a lot of work yes and um if you wonder whether judges are absenting themselves from the uh, from from the stage, uh, if you think that um, you know, if you do the exercise that you've just done a couple of minutes ago of comparing how our courts reacted to courts in many other jurisdictions in sort of developed democracies, um, you begin to find yourself forced to uh, 
um, only one possible answer to Bert's question, um, which is that there is no other remedy. Um, uh, the, the courts can't be um, seen as being an alternative to, to democratic campaigning. Um, question from Martin. Um, should the me mechanism for short-term laws be overhauled to allow flexibility for future emergencies? So, I mean, we definitely need to look at really carefully um, the way laws are passed during emergencies, because we've got a case study, which has just happened, um, of the most extreme variety you can imagine, where you had laws which have never, the like of which we've really never been seen before, at least not for 80 years, not since the Second World War. Um, so I think we, we're, we're doing that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm working with um, on the Commission um, um, on Emergency Powers with the Bingham Centre. I'm a commissioner um, with lots of really good people um, and, and chaired by um, Lord Justice Beetson. And we're going to be looking at, at those points. And I think that we're going to be reporting to the COVID inquiry. And the COVID inquiry is also going to be looking at those points. Um, I think also there, there is a sort of perennial problem in our society, in our British society, which is the use of statutory instruments which sounds really um uh well really techy and boring um, but it's really it's really important because that and, and and this has always been this has been a problem for a very long time i mean what, what, one of the case studies i look at in the book is the second world war and it was a problem then that the government effectively got to write the laws and avoid any kind of um scrutiny or accountability um which was good for them but not great for the laws and I think that the 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 the, the new um, bill that's going through Parliament, the EU um, retained EU law bill, basically creates this situation um, writ large, but on a permanent basis that the government can amend. So the government can write its own laws as long as they were laws that have been um, that were originally EU laws. It's a bit arbitrary, but it includes lots of different um, important laws like employment laws or um, environmental laws. So it's um, it's something that needs to be thought of really carefully and in a, in a way which doesn't bore people to death um, because it's about techie legal things. But I, I think it is really important. Yeah, and and a bit a bit a bit discouraging to say um, to hear parliamentarians say um, that they couldn't change the regulations, so they wouldn't scrutinise them. Um, just thinking back to an observation of yours um, from earlier on. Uh, Barbara asks, um, how do we, what do we do about a government that we fear is eroding our human rights, our right to protest? Um, and of course, I have in mind, and I imagine many uh, others in the audience have in mind this extraordinary thing absolutely extraordinary thing that's about to happen in the UK uh, of us joining um, Greece uh, after a military coup and Russia um, after it invaded Ukraine of in effect abandoning um, the European Convention on Human Rights. Does um, the law have anything to say about that? Um, how, how do we, how, how would you encourage people to respond to those, those concerns? Um, well, I mean, the, 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 I guess there's two things. There's the narrow thing of the uh, protest laws, which are coming in thick and fast at the moment. Um, and it's, it's, it's really worrying. Um, the, the pub, we've, we've had the Policing Act, which brought in this, um, which increased the ability of police to control protest if it's noisy, um, making it a sort of criminal offence to run an extremely noisy protest. And of course, all really good protests and really successful protests are really noisy. Um, but, and then there's the public order bill, which is, um, it's basically, to, it, it's the whole setup of the public order bill is to treat protest like you treat knife crime or gang violence. Um, and I don't mean that metaphorically. I mean, literally that the law, the, the, the mechanism, the legal mechanisms that are being put in place, such as, um, having zones where the police can stop can stop and search anybody they want without reasonable suspicion 
um, if they think they're going to um, commit a protest crime. Um, having um, protest banning orders, which will allow um, protesters to be tagged or um, or prevented going into city centres on, on, on penalty of contempt of court. Um, increasing the use of injunctions so that um, companies or the government can apply for, uh, sorry, the, the public authorities can easily apply for injunctions that um, around protest areas, which mean that any um, anybody doing the thing which is banned by the injunction, which could just be stepping over a line, could be put in prison for up to two years uh, for being in contempt of court. These are all um, extremely um, draconian measures to deal with peaceful protest. And, and I appreciate they are, um, the government say they're prompted by insulate Britain and people protest blocking roads. But I think what, what they're really about is um, Extinction Rebellion and Black Lives Matter, these, these mass um, movements um, that are taking over city centres or, or being part of being in city centres, at, 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 you know, for, for various parts of, of the summer or, or whatever it would be. And that is um, a step change for the UK. And I think it's pretty worrying. On, on the European Convention on Human Rights, I think the answer has got to be um, don't vote for the people who are saying we want to leave the European Convention on Human Rights because it's a um, it'll turn us into, you know, it's really Russia and Belarus. I think are the um, other countries which don't comply with which, which don't which aren't members of the European Convention on Human Rights, and we don't we really don't want to be in that club. Yes, um, Greece uh, left after the military coup. Um, but when democracy was restored in Greece, um, Greece rejoined uh, the convention. Um, uh, and it is um, extraordinary to me uh, that we might want to be in that company of Russia and Greece in the interregnum when it wasn't a democracy in finding that uh, European human rights law, this is um, not anything to do with the EU, uh, is um, too great a chafe on the power of the executive for it to bear. I mean, just just extraordinary. Human rights, of course, um, are international norms um, that protect all of us from all of our governments. Um, and, and the fact that our government is no longer prepared to extend those protections to um, its citizens, to us, I find um, really, really troubling. Um, I think it's the most worrying thing that's happened in in the country for, for, for many decades, actually. Um, question from Cole Sestrian. Um, how do you think the regulatory approach could have been organised to save lives um, and avoid long COVID better? Um, could it have been? Um, so changed. Um, that is a question, a bigger question that I than I can answer um, very well. But I think that the, um, I think I, I suspect what the COVID inquiry will say, um, just just to um, make a big prediction, is that particularly um, for, for each lockdown, there were three lockdowns. The government decided to do something which was the right approach probably for saving lives and protecting the NHS, but did it much later than it needed to have done it. And I think that's probably the, that, that will be, those will be the, the main mistakes along with the discharging people back to care homes from hospitals in a sort of disorderly way, which killed potentially tens of thousands of people. Um, but I think that's what I think I suspect the COVID inquiry won't say lockdowns were not justified. I think that will go against effectively world scientific consensus. Um, but they will say that the government every time um, dilly dallied um, rather than stopping the, the sort of curve that we all became so useful at, at the earlier stage. So I suspect that's what's going to happen. But um, I may and I have been wrong in the past. Um, on that um characteristically modest uh, note, Adam Wagner. It's been a, a real pleasure um, talking to you uh, about your wonderful book. Um, we will review the um, questions that have been sent in. We'll pick three. Um, we'll send um, copies to uh, those, those questions. I do strongly encourage everyone to read it. It's an important 
um, historic document, I think, recent history, but 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 salutary for the future as well. Um, I'm so grateful to everyone for for watching. Thanks so much for having me, and thanks everyone for coming.